To stay strong, every household needs a spiritual security system that alerts to any invasions. This message is the third in the series, House Builders. The message is entitled, Install a Security System, Part One. Here is Pastor Dale O'Shields. We're involved in a series of messages entitled House Builders. I wanna talk to you this weekend about how do you install a security system in your house? One of the most important terms in the entire scripture is the word house, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. You find this word coming up over and over again, house, 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 house. Very significant word. When you come to the New Testament, the original language of the New Testament is Greek, and the Greek word for house is the word oikos, and it's a word that has a lot of breadth of meaning and depth of meaning. The word oikos means a house as it refers to you as a person. You are building a house. Your life is a house. It is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're building a house perhaps with a family, marriage, relationship, kids. You're building a house in the work that you do. A lot of things that you are building in your life represents the building of a house or an oikos. And when it comes to building your house, your own life, or your family, your extended uh, relationships of home, uh, maybe your work environment, when you're building a house, you can build it well or you can build it poorly. It's extremely important that we learn how to build well. And the Bible is very clear with instructions as to how we are to go about building our house. And one of those things that's essential to build a good house is to make sure that you have a good security system. I'm sure that for many of you here today, if you own a home or live in an apartment, a condo, house, whatever it might be, you probably, many of you probably have some kind of security system. It might be a set of cameras that are watching the perimeter of your house or certain places in your house, or maybe a more elaborate system that informs the law enforcement agencies when there's an invasion in your home. I'm not sure perhaps what you may have, but many homes will have a security system against invasion. And I want to talk to you this weekend and next weekend about how do you build a security system spiritually in your house so that you can deal with potential invasions of the adversary in your life. To do that, today I'm going to share with you two things. One will be a basic fact that I want all of us to understand to bring us back to a clear, uh, very important fact from Scripture. And I'm going to share with you an additional thing today that will help us to get started on the journey of building a good security system. The first thing, as I said, is a fact. I want you to write this down, if you will, today, if you're taking notes, and that's this, that spiritual enemies are targeting your house. There are spiritual enemies that are targeting your house. This is perhaps no more clear than in the second, third, and fourth chapters of the book of Genesis. By the time you get to the very early stages of the Bible, you begin to see a house under attack. God created Adam and Eve. You can read about this in Genesis chapter 2. And he brought them together in marriage. And Adam and Eve, this man and wife, had their relationship sealed by God. There was no, never in history has there been a better forming of a marriage than this marriage. They were picked out by God to be partners for life, one with, a, with another. God established this home. He established this household. And so this was the perfect family living in the perfect environment. They were living in the Garden of Eden. You can't even imagine anything more perfect than what Adam and Eve experienced. By the time you get to the third chapter of the book of Genesis, you see something happening in this family unit. Let me take you there in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 1. Adam and Eve are together, having a great marriage with one another. The Bible says they were both naked and unashamed, living in the garden, had an amazing experience, relationship with one another. And then chapter 3, verse 1 brings us into this crisis moment. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Here's Adam and Eve in this beautiful garden, and now we see an invader. We see someone stepping in, a usurper stepping in, and he's identified here as the serpent. I think all of us know with any theological background or Sunday school training, we recognize that the serpent is none other than the devil, none other than Satan himself entering in to try to tempt Adam and Eve to veer away from God's plan for their life. And so there's this moment where there's an external spiritual attack that comes against Adam and Eve. And the same is true for your life, and the same is true for your family, the same is true for your house. You and I must recognize that as we go through life, we are going to face external spiritual attacks. There is a serpent that wants to find his way into your house to create destruction. 
I don't say that to make you afraid or somehow be intimidated. I say that to inform you so that you can be properly prepared. And that's part of what we're looking at in this series. How do you prepare yourself for these kind of attacks? But the serpent showed up on the scene. Now, this leads to the next thing in the story. There's been the the enticement, the temptation of the serpent. He's shown up trying to wreak havoc in this family. But now you see that Adam and Eve play a part in the story as well. In verses 2 through 7 of Genesis chapter 3, we find these words. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. First of all, you see this external attack. The serpent shows up to attack this family, to attack this household. But now you see Adam and Eve in conversation with the serpent, yielding to the temptation of the serpent, and now they accept a level of personal responsibility. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve ate of it. Adam ate of it. The enemy did not force them to eat. They ate of their own free will. They made a choice. And that is exactly how the serpent will work in your family. He will entice you towards certain things that are wrong, but ultimately you will make the decision to either cooperate with God, obey God, or to cooperate with the adversary. And when you do, it leads to the third thing I want to talk about briefly for a moment. That's the moral, the spiritual, the emotional, the relational decay or brokenness that happens as a result of cooperating with the serpent. I promise you that when Satan entices you towards something that is wrong, something that is away from God, he shows up in your house to attack you in in a certain way. And And when you and I agree with him and yield to his enticements, then it's only going to lead to bad places. It will erode you morally. It will cause there to be brokenness in you spiritually. It results in brokenness emotionally. It results in the breaking of relationships. Adam and Eve now entered into a terrible time in their relationship. For the first time in all of their history, they now were afraid. They'd never been afraid before. They now recognized that they were naked and they needed to sew fig leaves together to cover themselves. So there's shame there in the relationship. There's fear, there's shame, and there's blame that begins to happen in the relationship. Everything is going downhill. Why? Because sin, the serpent, has entered in. And by the time you get to chapter 4 of this very same book, Genesis chapter 4, it's passed on to their children as well, and Cain murders his very own brother Abel. I will tell you, there's a serpent There's an enemy that is after your house. And the choice that we have to make is whether we will cooperate with the adversary or cooperate with God. And if you and I choose to go the way of the serpent, then there's nothing but brokenness that we're going to experience in life morally and spiritually and emotionally and relationally. This warning about the attacks of this enemy are found all throughout the pages of the Bible. Let me give you another illustration from the Old Testament, then we'll look at two from the New Testament, actually three from the New Testament in just a moment. In the Old Testament, there was a man by the name of Nehemiah. You might remember him. Nehemiah was charged with the responsibility of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem after the Jews had returned from Babylonian captivity. They had failed to rebuild the protective walls. And so they were living in Jerusalem, but they did not have a security system. The walls were broken down. And so enemies could come in any time and, and again, sort of ransack the city and cause them all kind of trouble and harm. And so Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem along with the Jews there, and and the decision is we're going to rebuild these walls so that we will be protected. And so as soon as they started building a security system, rebuilding the walls of the city, they came under attack. 
Sanballat, Tobiah, and a variety of others began to attack Nehemiah and the people because they were building something that was going to provide security for them. There was an external attack, and Nehemiah had to rise up and make a very strong statement to those who were the rebuilders. Notice his statement in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse number 14. After I looked things over, talking about looking over the walls and looking over the situation with the enemies approaching, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And notice this, fight for your families. Fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. One translation of least says your houses, your homes, your houses. Fight for them. Nehemiah says you've got to put up a fight. You have to resist because there's an enemy that's trying to take territory from you. Paul, the apostle, reminded us of this attack that all of us are under in Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. And he's sobering us with these words. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Whose schemes? The devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul says, in your homes, in your houses, in your families, in your relationships, don't make the other person your enemy. You're not fighting people. Our battle is not with flesh and blood. There's an invisible spiritual force that wants to find his way into your relationships and wreak havoc destroy relationships and destroy your life. And that one is the devil. Be aware of him and be aware of his devices and stand firm against him. Peter echoes this in 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Be alert and of a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Folks, I would submit to you this morning that if Paul and Peter believed in the reality of the devil and the intent of the devil to attack us, I believe that we should accept that as a reality as well. Would you agree? Right there in the Bible, we're told that we are under attack and our households are under attack. Notice what Jesus said. Jesus himself pointed to this in in Matthew chapter 24, verse 43. Now, before I read this verse, I want to make it very clear that this entire passage, Matthew 24, is a, a passage about Jesus' second coming. It's called the Olivet Discourse. Jesus gave this discourse, this sermon, if you will, on on the Mount of Olives, talking about the day that he would come back again. But in the context of this Olivet Discourse, this sermon that Jesus gave us about his second coming, he gives us a little nugget of truth that is so valuable to us about our houses that I did not want to miss the opportunity of sharing it with you. Matthew 24, verse 43. These are the words of Jesus. But understand this, if the owner of the house, what are we talking about in this series? The house, right? If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. I'm going to encourage you to circle some words there on your notes. If the owner of the house, circle that phrase, the house, your house, okay, had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would, he would have kept watch and would not have, circle this phrase or underline it, let his house be broken into, would not have let his house be broken into. Let's, let's look at this, message, this, this verse for a moment. Jesus said, if you knew that a thief was coming to break into your house, let's say you received a text message this afternoon from your local thief. <laughs> he says, hi, I'm your local thief and I'll be at your house at 2 a.m. this morning, it's coming morning. I'm coming to steal everything you got. I've done it all around your neighborhood. You're next on my list. So you get this text. You believe the validity of the text. What would you be doing about 1 a.m.? If he says, I'm going to show up at 2 a.m., some of you even before that, you'd have all of the Montgomery County Police Department at your house, right? Okay, We're going to catch this guy. Why? Because you know when he's coming. Here's the thing you have to to realize. When it comes to our spiritual enemy, you don't know when he's coming. You don't know when he's going to show up in your house. That was the point that Jesus was making. He said, you don't know when I'm going to come. You don't know when a thief is going to come. Jesus comes as a thief in the night, but there's a thief coming to your house, and you don't know when he's coming. 
And when he comes, he wants to break into your house. Notice that phrase I asked you to circle or highlight or underline a moment ago, break into your house. The actual Greek rendering of that term means to dig under the foundation and dig through your house. So here's what you must recognize. When the enemy comes, he doesn't all, generally always come with every, all of his full force at once. He comes little by little and finds ways to dig in so he can get his claws, his influence in your house. It's a process where we let him in that we need to now shut down. You need a spiritual security system because there's a thief that is coming to your house. I promise you. Our houses are under attack. Our lives are under attack spiritually. Again, I don't say that to make you afraid. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. Aren't you glad for that, okay? So this is not a message about fear. It's a message about warning. It's a message about sobriety. It's a message about reality that we are under attack. We must grasp that truth or we'll never do anything about it. Now, that being said, I want to take you to the very first thing that we are to do when it comes to setting a security system in our life. I'm going to talk about more related to this next weekend, so I hope you'll come back for that part of the series as we continue on in this series together for the next several weeks, but next week is an important part of this. But only one thing I want to talk to you about today when it comes to securing your house against the threat of the thief. Anybody here want to keep the devil out of your house? He's coming to your house. You want to keep him out, right? Are you with me here so far? Okay. The first thing that is essential if you want to keep the devil out of your house is your house needs a secure atmosphere. Go ahead and write that down. I'll explain it to you. What you need in your house is an atmosphere that has been secured by the peace of God. See, a lot of times the way the devil gets into your house, listen closely, profound here, The way the devil gets in your house, he doesn't have to dig through surreptitiously to get in your house. You bring him in with you. You bring him into your house with your actions. You bring him into your house through your attitudes. You you just walk right through the door with the devil right alongside you. With the words that you speak and the attitudes that come a part of your life, become a part of who you are, and you bring it into your home because now you've brought in the attitude that is hellish, okay? The attitude, the actions that are contrary to what God would want that family to be. And so the enemy has to do very little work in terms of attacking because you're doing his work for him by what you bring into your home. So by who and what we are, we've got to make some changes in our life so that we're not bringing the devil in with us, okay? That we're leaving him at the door. We're making sure that we're not allowing him access into our homes by the way we behave, by the way that we talk, by the way that we demonstrate certain attitudes. It's so vital that we grasp this truth. And so what God wants to happen in your home, if you're going to secure your home from the adversary, you've got to start with you. You've got to start with your own life. You've got to start with how you're living your life, how you're thinking, how you're behaving, how you're speaking. It's extremely important that we learn to live differently in our homes because we want our homes to be an environment of God's blessing and an environment of God's peace. And the only way that that can happen is that we have to establish that by God's help and power in our homes. Romans 14, verse 19. Listen to it. So then, make it your top priority. Now, when God says something is a top priority, what does that mean? It means put it at the top of the list, right? So then make it your top priority to live a life of peace with harmony in your relationships, eagerly seeking to strengthen and encourage one another. I'll come back to this verse in a moment. Notice Ephesians 4 verse 29. We're told about how to behave in our relationships and never let ugly or hateful words come from your mouth, but instead let your words become beautiful gifts that encourage others. Do this by speaking words of grace to help them. And so now Paul is talking to us about the way we speak, the way that we communicate. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11. Therefore, encourage, not discourage, encourage one another and build each other up. Don't tear each other down, build each other up, just as in fact you're doing. So we're talking here about encouragement. Matthew 7, 12. Would you read this together with me aloud and loudly across our campuses? Let's read. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. 
This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. We perhaps know this better. Do unto others as you would have others to do unto you. What do we call that? We call that the golden rule. Why? Because it's what creates blessing and benefit in your life. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Now, here's what I want you to see. Listen closely. You can do all the praying that you want to do in your house. You can pray from sunrise to sunset. You can declare all the scriptures you want to declare over your house. You can get outside your house and march around your house in the name of Jesus and claim victory in your house. But if you bring the devil in with you, I promise you all the praying and all the declaration and all the marching around your house is not going to do a single thing for you if the devil is living through you with the attitudes and actions you bring through the door yourself. It's not going to be an antidote to all that. Now, I'm not, I believe in all. You need to pray all that you can pray. You need to quote scripture and declare God's word over your house. You need to do like I talked about last week. Get out and march around the boundaries of your home and put your foot down. I believe in all that's very valuable. But you can negate all of that by what you bring into your house with you. Just by your very own actions and your very own attitude, you can completely make that null and void because now you're in cooperation with the very one that's wanting to bring destruction to your family. Notice again Romans 14 verse 19. Listen closely to this one more time. In fact, why don't we read it together slowly and loudly together. Are you ready? So then, make it your top priority to live a life of peace with harmony in your relationships eagerly seeking to strengthen and encourage one another. If we lived that way, would our houses be a lot better? That one verse of scripture could transform everything about our houses. For your house to be secure, you need a secure atmosphere in your house. And to have a secure atmosphere in your house, you've got to have peace in your house. That's how you're most secure, you feel most secure in an environment of peace. All of us are looking for peace. When you get ready to go on a vacation, you don't say, ah, hey, I wanna, I'm really looking for a great place that's going to agitate me. You don't do that, okay? When you're going on a vacation, you say, I want to go to a place that's going to give me some peace. I need some rest and peace. And so you don't look for things that irritate you. You're looking for things that bring peace in your life because peace brings security. Everywhere there's a sense of peace, there's security. Where there's security, there will be peace. Those things always go together. And here's what I want you to see today. Peace doesn't start with somebody else. Peace starts with you, okay? If you don't have peace in you, there's not going to be any peace around you. If you're all in turmoil yourself all the time, you're agitated about this thing or something else and angry about things in your life, you're carrying this stuff inside you, and you walk in your house with that stuff inside of you, and then another family member walks into the house with that stuff inside of them, and somebody else walks into the house with that stuff inside of them, then what do you have in your house? You have all that stuff in your house, right? Okay. And so what you want to do is you want to get to that place where you're living in this attitude of peace inside. There's a sense of, of confidence and peace and, and, and rest in you so you can bring that into your home. That's a part of securing the environment. You will never have a secure home without developing that those attitudes in your life. So I'm going to tell you today how to do this. I'm going to give you eight things in the next few moments. Eight very important, actual, practical steps that you can take today that will help you to start this process. Now, before I go to those eight things, I want to remind you of what we talked about last weekend. These messages are somewhat cumulative. Do you remember last weekend from, uh, from Matthew chapter 7, I believe it was, that I talked about uh, Jesus said that the wise man builds his house on a rock, right? Remember that part of the story? Anybody remember that last week? Okay, okay. And the wise man who builds his house on the rock, when the storms come, the foundation is there and it's secure. And the wise man is very clearly described for us as a man who hears the word of God and puts it into practice, right? Okay. Not just hearing. I emphasized that last weekend. You happen to remember that, right? But you hear it and you put it into practice practice. It's not just enough to hear it. There are a lot of people today that will go to messages all around the world and sit in services like we're sitting today. They will hear a message that will describe for them how they are to live, what Jesus wants to do in their life, etc., but they will never put it into practice. Does that have any benefit to them? No. It only has a benefit when you put it into practice. So today I'm going to give you some practical things to do. 
eight practical things to do that will establish a secure environment in your home. And I'm going to use the word liberate because what I've discovered in life that when you're in a secure environment that is filled with peace, it is very liberating, is it not? I mean, it's so freeing when you're in an atmosphere of peace and an atmosphere of harmony. It's a wonderful, it just liberates your soul. So I'm going to use the word liberate to help us to describe the actions that are necessary to create that kind of environment. And so we'll use this as an acronym. The first one, L, write it down. Here's the key. You have to learn to lean into relationships. What I mean by leaning in, let's use the posture concept for a moment. If I am in a conversation with you, you've all had always, uh, all of you have had conversations with people where they, when you're, co- when you're conversing with them, they're like, they're like leaning into you and listening to your story and paying attention to what's going on. You also had other, other people that were totally disinterested. You're trying to tell them something, they've got either got their back turned to you or they're leaning away from you. Which one do you like to talk to most? The one that's leaning in, right? And here, when it, when it comes to relationships, relationships don't happen until you lean into them. You have to make them a priority in your life. So you lean in the direction of the, those other people in your house. That means you make time for them, right? You cannot build a relationship without the investment of T I M E. Someone said, How do you spell love? You spell it T I M E, okay? You don't spell love, M-O-N-E-Y. You spell love, T-I-M-E, okay? A lot of people try to spell love, M-O-N-E-Y. No, you don't spell love that way. You spell love, T-I-M-E. How do I know that you love me? Because you're willing to spend some time with me, that I'm important. I'm leaning into the relationships. How many houses do we have? I don't say this to condemn. I'm trying to help you today, amen? Help us today. How many houses do we have where everybody in the house, they're going their own direction, they're living their own lives, and there's never really any connecting point? That's why, this is a side note, I've not not even mentioned this in other messages, so you guys must be really special today because you're going to get something extra, extra today. That's why the family meal is so important. One of the things that has gone by the wayside nowadays is the family coming together and having a family meal. And he said, well, there's no way we can do that at our house. Well, yeah, you can. You can find it. If it's not a family meal, it's a family something, okay, where at some point in time of the day, everybody comes together just if it's nothing else. How was your day? It's leaning in. You can't build a relationship until you lean into relationships. Got it? The I stands for improving your relationship skills and awareness, that you get better at doing relationships. Here's what I want you to understand today. If you want better relationships, you need better relationship skills. See, building relationship is not just something that happens. It requires skills. There are skills that everybody can learn. You can get better. Somebody would say, well, I'm not a very relational person. My answer to that is, well, get relational. I don't have too many friends. I have a secret for you. Ready? Be friendly. Okay. Right? You learn these skills in your life, and these skills enhance your capacity to lean in. And these skills are very simple. They're not complex. When you're having a conversation with someone, you learn that listening is a vital part of the conversation. So you lean in that person's direction. You actually make eye contact with them when they're talking, and you, then you feed back to them what you heard them say to make sure you really did understand what they were saying. It's really simple stuff. It's, it's communication. See, relationships are built with communication, and so these are the skills that you learn. You learn to spend some time asking the other person about their life instead of talking about your life all the time, right? You make other people important in your life. And so these are skills that you can develop. The reason that we don't have better homes and better marriages and better friendships and better relationships is because we're not taking the time to learn the skills. We keep doing the same old dysfunctional stuff over and over again, and we repeat it. And it's really the classic definition of, 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 of idiocy, if you will. It's the classic definition of not really understanding how to grow when you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the dis- results to be different. You have to change something, and part of what you change is to learn how to actually increase your skills. You can be better at relationships, but you have to accept the responsibility to grow your own relational skills, your relational awareness. And so L, lean into what? Relationships. I, what do you have to do? Improve. You need to get better. I need to get better at relating to people, and this is something you can do, all right? The next one is B. B stands for banning destructive words. 
We're talking practically here. How do you keep the devil out of your house? Shut up. Okay. Right? Because the devil so many times comes right out through that tongue. Are you with me? And so the devil wants to, to create a problem in your home. You're agitated about something and you, you speak before you think, okay? You put your mouth in gear before your mind is activated, okay? And so your mouth is running and saying all kinds of things. And before long, you've said destructive words. And now you've got something to add on top of what's already been frustrating you. You've got a problem that's now exacerbated from what it was before. You've thrown, you've thrown fuel on the fire, if you will. And your words have created a problem for you. Let me remind you today that you can control your tongue. The tongue is not an independent force. It just wags without your cooperation. If you don't feel like you can control your tongue, I will promise you this is a better solution than just letting it wag. Go to the hardware store and bag it by a big roll of duct tape. It works well, okay? <laughs> just slap it across your face whenever you need. When you cannot seemingly control what you're about to say, say, excuse me for a moment, okay? You walk around, you grab your big old strip of duct tape and slap it right across between your ears at the lower part of your face, and I promise you it'll be hard to say anything destructive with all that sticky stuff on your mouth, okay? But it's worth it to do. So what I'm saying, this is so important because the devil walks into your house through your words. Are you with me today? Okay. And so you have to ban destructive words. I'm not going to speak those words. I refuse to say that. Now you can't, you can't, you can't make somebody else change their words, but you can change yours. The Bible says a gentle answer turns away wrath, Proverbs 15, verse 1. You can, even when they are wrathful toward you, you don't have to be wrathful in return, okay? You choose your behavior, okay? So, L, lean into, help me out here, lean into the relationships. I, you, improve your relationship skills. B, you, ban destructive words. E, you, encourage. How many of you appreciate some encouragement from time to time? Come on, raise your hand, nod your head, do something, okay? I think most of us are, we are, we are famished for encouragement, okay? Most of us could use a steady, I mean, we are so bombarded with our own negative thoughts and with the world around us on an ongoing basis. We are, we are, we are starving for some encouragement. And one of the best things you can learn to do in your house is to speak encouraging words to the people around you. You're, you're going to make it. I believe in you. I love you. I appreciate you. I think you've got an amazing future. I'm standing with you. I believe you're going to have a great school year this year. I believe, I believe God's going to bless you today. Speaking words like this, you're now, you're, instead of destructive words, you're speaking life-giving words. You're, you're putting some encouragement. In fact, the word encouragement means to engage with or to impart courage, to impart inspiration to another person. And so it's amazing to think that God has given us the ability to actually impart life through our words. The power of life and death are found in the tongue in the words of your mouth. And so we've got L, lean into I, improve your relationship skills. B, ban destructive words. E, encourage regularly. R, show respect. Every human being is deserving of respect. Not, not one single person in this room today, any of our campuses, you don't appreciate when someone disrespects you, do you? It's a hurtful thing when someone says something that's disrespectful to you, that, 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 that cuts away at your value, your esteem, your worth. And yet, so often in our families, we speak disrespectful words, and we just think they're somehow going to go over that person's head or not make any long-term impact. And here we are, maybe years or decades later, we're still suffering from the disrespect we showed years ago. We sowed seeds of disrespect in our families, in our homes, in our environments, in our workplaces. And what you need to do is make sure that you're showing another person that you respect them. You don't have to agree with them on everything to respect them. Amen? I'll go even a step further. You don't even have to like them to respect them. 
See, respect is not about liking. Respect is not about agreeing. Respect is about you are a human being that is worthy of dignity and worthy of, of value. You're a creation of God. I'm going to respect you as such in the same way that I hope you will respect me. And respect is a tremendous thing when the house is filled with an environment of respect. All right? L, lean into relationship. I, improve. B, ban destructive words. E, Encourage, regular, R, show, A, accept personality differences. Not everybody in the world is just like you. Thank God. Okay. <laughs> and not everybody in the world is just like me. And so when you begin to accept the fact that people are different, they have different personalities. It's, it's a wonderful freeing thing that happens when you give another person the permission to be themselves. It's a tremendous thing that happens. And when you get to that place of now, I'm going to accept you're different from me, but, but it's okay. I remember when we, my wife and I first got married, I couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. I, I couldn't. I couldn't figure out what was wrong because I know I'm right, okay? And the way I do things are right, okay? There's the right way to do things, and I always do it the right way, okay? And she wasn't doing it the way I did it, so that made her, if I'm right, what is she? Wrong. Wrong, okay? I mean, it's pretty clear, right? I mean, I'm not a super scientist, but I could figure that one out. I'm right, she's wrong. She's not doing it my way, okay? But I learned over a period of time that, that you know, it wasn't a matter that there are other ways to do things, and just because I do things one way and she does things another way, it doesn't mean that I'm right and she, she's wrong. It means that we are different, Okay? And so I, I learned to accept how she approached things. Men and women are different, more than biology, okay? They're different, the way that they process things. When I have a conversation with my wife, she takes off and she flies everywhere with the conversation. I'm like, are we going somewhere with this? Just hang with me, okay? She's flying all over the world. I can't figure out her flight path to save my life. I have no idea, but she knows exactly the runway she's going to land on. She just knows how to get there her way, okay? And that used to bother me because I, I'm a bottom line. I just give me the bottom line. I just want to know the bottom line. I don't want to go on a long journey. I didn't sign up for a cruise, okay? I didn't sign up for this, okay? I just want to know the bottom line, okay? Can we get to the bottom line fast, okay? But no, we're going to fly around forever. We're going to sail the seven seas, okay? And finally, we're going to get at the answer at some point in time. And it was so frustrating to me because I want to get to the bottom line, and you're going a trip around the world, okay? We could solve this conversation in about three minutes if you get to the bottom line. We don't need an hour and a half to have this conversation, okay? Right? And I realized something, you know, she's different. She's getting to her journey, and we made an agreement with one another. Tell me the bottom line first, okay? okay? I'll hang with you on the journey if I know the bottom. I just need to know, basically, first and foremost, am I in trouble? That's all I need to know before we get to the end, okay? That's the, I just want to know, am I in trouble, okay? Because uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to be really anxious until we get to the bottom, because I'm not sure where we're going with this, and it might be that... I, I'm, I'm in trouble, okay? So let's get to the bottom. You know, men and, men and women are different. Men carry wallets. Give me my wallet. I can do a trip around the world with my wallet. I don't need anything else. My wife has a purse. Inside her purse, she has everything in the world, okay? She's got clean Kleenexes. She has used Kleenexes, okay? She's got aspirin, Tylenol, Benadryl, Advil, I'm telling you, okay? Everything in the wife. In fact, when I go to the doctor, I get a prescription. I never go to the pharmacy. I just go to my wife. It's like, okay. Here it is. Could you fill this for me? Sure. I guess so. Why? Because they're different, okay? Different, okay? So you have to learn to, to laugh at the differences, to accept that. Don't make such a big deal of the differences, amen, okay? In fact, if you, if you accept the difference, you, you might learn something from the other person, right? Got it? Okay. And so L, lean into what? Relationships. I improve. B, ban what? 
destructive words. E, encouragement. R, show respect. Is A next? Okay, okay. I'm getting lost in my own acronym here, okay? A, accept what? Differences. Accept the differences, the personality. So L-I-B-E-R-A-T. Here's one I cheated on just a little bit. Retrain your brain, okay? Train your brain. What I mean by that is this. When you've had years of maybe bad relationship patterns, you get stuck in a way that you think about a person, right? And you put them in a box, and that's who they are. And, you, and once you get them in a box, they're going to be in that box forever. And you can give them no chance to change, no opportunity to be improved, nothing to grow in their life, because now I've put you in this box, and now I've shaped the box that you fit in. I'm going to view you that way for the rest of my life, okay? And we do that to people, don't we? We put people in boxes, and we never give opportunity for them to, to grow or to change. And so they're always feeling that judgment from us because we've been judged into that box. And you have to retrain your brain to say, you know what? That person doesn't always have to be that way. I can expand my thinking. I can retrain the way that I think about my relationships and relationship patterns. Why is this important? Because as goes your brain, so goes your feelings. As goes your brain, so goes your emotions. What you think about is what you feel, okay? If you think about something or someone a certain way for an extended period of time, it's going to create a, a whole set of emotions that you will carry with you toward that person, either good or bad, positive or negative. So retrain your brain. Give people some space in their life. Do you appreciate space in your life? You pre appreciate some room? Do you, do you like it when somebody puts you in a box? No, none of us do. So retrain your brain. And the last one here, the E, last E, Exaggerate, read it with me. Exaggerate the positives and minimize the negatives. Now, exaggerate means to make it more than it is, okay? I, I get that. It's to expand it beyond what it really is. But here's what I want you to see. Anytime you're upset with a person, anytime you're upset with a person, whether you realize it or not, you always exaggerate their negatives. Anytime you're frustrated with someone, in your mind, they're always worse than they really are. Because as soon as you're upset with someone, your mind goes to work and listing in your mind. You may not think of it logically this way, but you begin to think about all the things that are wrong with that person. And then after you've gotten through thinking about all the things that are really wrong with them, you add a few things that aren't really wrong with them just because you're mad at them, okay? Right? And so I'm you're going to exaggerate one way or the other. So what I want to encourage you to do is start exaggerating the positives of another person instead of the negatives, because if you exaggerate the positives, what you appreciate, appreciates. Did you hear that? Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When you treasure someone, your heart is more connected to them. It creates a, a flow, a more positive flow in your interaction with them. And so what have we learned today? Number one, please remember, please remember, please be aware that your house is under attack. I'm not saying that again to scare you. I'm saying that to awaken you, to sober you. We are under, we're in a battlefield and our houses are targeted just like the house of Adam and Eve was targeted. And then how do we set a security system? We start with ourselves. If I can bring Jesus into my house with me every day instead of the devil into the, my house with me every day, there's a whole lot more secure environment that liberates life there and provides us a solid and secure environment than could happen any other way. That's the beginning point to make the choice yourself to show Jesus in your house. Would you bow your heads together with me as we pray? Lord, thank you for your word this morning. We're so very grateful for the word of God, how you instruct us. We ask you to take this message and apply it. Help us to apply it, Lord, in our lives. Help us to be doers of the word, not just hearers. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. I would like to close today by giving you an opportunity to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me right now? Right where you are, just simply bow your head with me and I'm going to give you a prayer to pray and you can simply speak this prayer out, whisper this prayer out and from the sincerity of your heart, call upon God and I promise you that He will hear and answer you. So let's pray together. Start by simply whispering the name Jesus. Let there come uh, from your heart just the declaration of His name. Say, Jesus. I know that, that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short with you. I'm sorry for all of my sins. 
Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are God's son. I believe that you are the savior of the world. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you are alive today. Now pray these words. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new start in you. I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to encourage you with a promise from God's Word that says that when we call upon God's name, we call upon the Son of God, there is salvation that comes to our lives. He changes us from the inside out, and you become a new creation. All things pass away. All things become new. And that's exactly what has happened to you today. Your next step really is to make sure that you get into a good Bible-believing church. And you begin to study God's Word, get God's Word in you, and to make sure that you get a copy of the Bible if you don't have one and begin to read it. Spend some time every day in prayer. And I would encourage you also to check out the resources on our website that will help you to get going in your relationship with Jesus. You can find them at church-redeemer.org. Get those into your hands. Get started in your new life with Jesus Christ. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next time. If you've prayed with a pastor today and made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, we have some resources for you on our website. Just go to church-redeemer.org slash a new you. We pray that this message was a blessing to you.